Let's do a blue snail for in. Alright, so if we had a snail that was coming along and wanting to visit a steam, we're going to make, usually I think in these thirds and all these other kinds of things, but we're going to go simple for the snail. We're just going to have the snail be the main focus of interest pretty much right in the center of the screen. Now that being said, I'm still going to draw about a third line and assume that that's the rounding line for the snail. That's about a third. And then have two-thirds in the air be the sky. Now we get back to the same problem against blue against blue, but we're going to make the sky really, really light blue so that the blue snail stands out against it. See, now I'm thinking maybe I should make it a yellow snail. All right, we're going to change gears. We're going to make it a yellow snail so that it can stand out against the blue sky and the blue or the green grass. Do we want to do that or do we want to do blue, blue snail? Yellow snail, blue snail, and let's do a blue snail. All right, what does a snail look like? Cute snail. In general, when you think of objects that you're looking at visually, <laughs> which I suppose you know is the only way you look at objects, but what, what I'm trying to say is that you tend to look at things from left to right and top to bottom because that's the way in the U.S. and in European countries we are taught to read. So we are taught to look at things starting in the top left and to work our way down to the bottom right of a page. And the same tends to happen when we look at art. And of course, art can change the way that you look at things depending on where the main focus object is and all that other sort of stuff. But it generally helps to work with the way the brain is already being wired and to make things look to the right if it's uh, appropriate for the scene that you're setting. Unless, you know, there's two characters looking at each other, in which case you want them to look at each other. But if you have things look towards the right, especially if you're doing a children's book or something like that, encourages the person to keep looking to the right and turning the page and keep moving forward with the story. So just something to think about. So we're going to make a snail shape and we're going to make it going towards the right. And we're going to give it a snail body. Yeah, let's not start with the body, let's start with the shell. <laughs> And again, we want to keep it within the confines of the paper so that there's space for a mat, so that if someone wants to map this original piece of art, there's space around the edges. And the same thing when you're doing books, there's going to be some area on the sides that gets lost to the printing process. So you want to keep all of your key objects in towards the center of this thing that you're working on and not right up against the edge anywhere. So we're going to do snaily. Shape. We're going to do a snaily head. I like to have big eyes. Snails have tails. I don't see any of these snails I'm looking at having tails. Some of have the little trailing parts. I do like that. They do have cute antennas. I love antennas and snails. So we'll give them his little cute antennas. With the little ball thing. Sorry, snail. A little out of control there. In fact, I think this whole eyeball in me for him is a little too large. That's why we have an eraser. Okay. 
right, we got a happy snail. Alright, snail shows. How does this rest against the body? Right, I think that that up part is a little too much. I think it needs to go down here a little more, a little more traction, so you can pull this snail shell along. It's all about balance. Make it connect a little more. Alright, so we got the snail. We should be able to see the background through his shell. So now we take out that background line. Show us. Take that out a little more. Alright, so now we think a little bit about. Anything in the background here, maybe a mushroom. And you don't want to get too close to the edge with anything that's too important, but it doesn't really matter if the mushroom gets clipped a little bit, since it's just sort of a background element. Now it's funny, usually I do the mushrooms in red and white, but clearly I can't do that today since we are working just with blues and greens and things. Now also oddly, although I drew that line straight across, I swear I drew that line straight across, the mushroom side looks like it's higher than the back side. It is pretty much a straight line, and it's reasonably parallel with the back side. Oh, it's a tiny bit off. It's funny how the human eye can get sensitive about that sort of stuff. Oh, that looks a little better. All right. No, if anything, the back looks a little hair. All right, we're going to stop putzing with it. <laughs> It will be okay. Alright, we can add little grasses and things like that as we go. But the idea is just to get a general baseline for what we are doing. Alright, let's put in the ink. Again, when you're using ink, you want it to be waterproof ink when you are working with watercolors because the ink drop is a little lower because you know, it's a little better. It's funny how just tiny differences get seen by the eye because we are so used to seeing our natural world in a certain proportion that if things are just a little off our eye notices it as being not quite right. Again, make sure you use a waterproof pen if you are working with watercolors because you do not want the water from the watercolor to make the pen smear. So any waterproof pen is fine. The one that I use happens to be a Sakura Jelly Roll 06. 
But this is just what I have. You can use whichever one you want. But this time I will not use black paint. <laughs> this is a three color challenge and well technically one could say white and black aren't really colors. I mean I'm using black for the pen so Cautious when you're drying in the pen and that pen is still wet that you do not smear it with your own hand where you're resting on things. My hands are trembly so I in general have to rest my hand on the paper to try to keep things reasonably straight so I have to be careful not to smudge the ink and cause problems for myself. Well, we all have different challenges. You know, some of us have eyesight problems, some of us have mobility problems, and we just move on with what our challenges are and find whatever kinds of solutions we can. With the pencil, you can keep erasing and erasing with the pen. You could use white out, but it's a lot harder to get rid of pen. If you have a expensive style of paper, you could use Windex and a Q-tip to try to scrub away pen. But with the papers I use, I have not had much luck trying to do that, so I just have to be cautious when I'm putting the pen down in the first place. Alright, all right, so we have the basis of the idea here. Give that a moment to dry. You might think of pen as not needing to dry, but it does actually come down wet. And it's good to give it a moment to dry before you start using it. So the colors that we're working with again are Gamboge, Green Light, I suppose I'll put them in the correct order according to those colors, and Cerulean Blue. So we're going to make the snail blue this time since last time we made green the predominant color in our color combination. So again, I think I will start by putting in some of the background colors. I'm going to rinse my brush off and just do a wet wash on the bottom, just uh, painting with water so that when I put in the paint, it just spreads out nice and randomly creates that sense of just loose grass. So all I'm doing is putting water in on the areas that I want to turn green and then I'll pick up a little of this green and sort of a mishmash of green and some of the yellow and some of the blue and I like that because it will give that sense of natural grass. That it's not just one color but it's a range of colors. And I don't mind that it goes a little over the lines because I like the loose sketching feel of it that you're on location and it's also why I don't mind that it's curling a little here because that's what happens when you're on location and you're just sketching. So I like that kind of sense of quick, loose, free, maybe not quite that much. So if it gets a little too much in an area that you don't want, if you rinse your brush and then mostly dry it so it becomes damp then you can lift off the paint like a sponge 
and that can help you get the paint away from the areas that you don't want it in. In general, it's nice to have it darker down in the front and then get lighter as it goes towards the back. But you know, there's always exceptions. There's times that you want to do the exact opposite. But in many cases, it's good to have it darker down at the bottom, and then as it gets lighter, as it heads toward the back, it gives that sense of depth. Alright, I well, want a few more other colors in here, so it looks a little less monochromatic. Nature is rarely monochromatic. Nature generally has a bit of a range of colors going on. Again, the idea isn't that we're going to be having a lot of attention drawn to this grass. <laughs> the grass is just a background, but we still want it to look like it's part of the scene so that it doesn't stand out in an odd kind of way. So darker down at the bottom. And also a little darker under the snail act as a grounding point for him so that he feels like he's a part of the scene. A little blue in there. Alright, it's a start at least. Alright, next we're going to do the sky. When we're working on the sky, we don't want to get too close to this green while the green is drying because then it will merge together and while there's some blue down there in the grass you don't want it to completely merge with the blue in the sky area. Alright, so I clean my brush off, get some nice fresh clean water. So once again I'm just putting clear water in the sky areas. I'm only going to do the left side first because my house is so dry that this dries super fast. And I can just work on one section at a time. So get that dry, or get that wet, I mean. <laughs> Put some blue, and you can see how it just sort of flows and blends. I like that effect, especially in background areas. Very careful down there at the bottom, not to get too close to the green. This side will be tricky because it's already crossed the line over here. I'll just stay away from there for now. Alright, make the rest of the area wet. And again, you can see the paper is curling a little. I'm okay with that. If you want to be more attentive to detail, you could pre-wet it. You could tape it down. And all of those things will help you manage the process. And being very careful about the edge area. There we 
the snail itself is blue, so I don't want to go too dark with the sky blue, because then it'll be hard to get the snail blue to stand out against it. So as tempting as it might be to now load in a bunch of blue for the sky, I'm going to be happy to have it dry light. that the snail blue can go on nice and dark and really stand out against it. I really don't want any sharp lines in the sky. <laughs> Skies don't tend to have sharp lines in them. So it's good to uh, smooth out any brush strokes. It's fine to have whitish areas because those could be clouds or so on. Some sky in between the antennas. I'm going to take care of any bright white areas because those will draw the eyeball. And you don't want the eyeball drawn to random white spots. You want the eyeball to be drawn to the actual features that you want the eye to pay attention to. from here. So I want to smooth that out. Cat's coming over to say hello. Cat, this is wet, so I don't really want you stepping on this. You're a very good kitty. Very good kitty, yes. You are so helpful. There really isn't anywhere over here, kitty, that I think you should be going right now. Because... Nope, uh, sweetie. Wet things. I don't want you stepping on. Go that way, please. Thank you. All right, well, what color can the mushroom be? Well, I suppose it can be green, since it's in a blue sky. I really don't want it to be blue. And it can be yellow, but I don't want it to take away too much from the snail, and having a bright yellow thing over there might take away from it. I can make it a pale yellow. So I'm going to go with a pale yellow. be a little different from the grass so it doesn't just look like the grass is sprouting up here. I'm being a little cavalier because I'm going right up against the bright wet yellow and that could all merge together but so far it's behaving itself so that is good. Some of the yellow did get out into the blue but that is all right. All right, blue snail. So it's going to be a nice rich blue because it has to stand out against this blue sky that we just made. So we're going to go right for the blue core here. You can see on one hand that it doesn't really matter if we paint it in a spiral direction, but people do actually see the brush strokes that you're working with. So it's good to have the brush strokes be in the direction that the object you're painting would naturally be in. So if they see the brush strokes, 
in a spiral direction. deal with differentiating the spirals later. The watercolor is a task of the layers. So we're putting down a first starting layer to get this dark blue settled and starting to dry. It's the same blue as the sky mostly, so it's not too troubling to get it touching the sky, but still I want to keep the darkness of this blue separate from the lighter sky blue because we want this to be able to stand out. So hopefully the sky blue is mostly dry at this point. I'm trying to go right up to that edge. Normally I say that I don't mind if it flows over a little, but in this case it's not about the lines as much as I don't want a giant billowing of dark blue to head out into the sky. You can see a little bit's happening there, but I will do it in a second. In general, I think of my sun as shining from the top right. So I think of things on the top right as being lighter, and things in the bottom left as being a little darker in shadow. I've got a hair here, which may be adding to my problems, and I can't get it up. Come on here. There we go. Later, let's finish up with our blue main snail shell. Alright, so something I'm pondering as I'm getting down here is what color to make his body, and I'm thinking yellow. Don't want to make it green because all the grass is green. And I don't think I want to make it blue, because we've already got a blue sky and the blue shell, which is a feature, and I want it to be able to stand out a little bit against all these other things. Shadowing the back side would be darker. The lower side would be darker. The left side of any of these curls would have a shadow to it. these shadows we're going to have to put in after the first layer dries. in the first round of some of these shadows. Give this 
sense that the back side of it is a little darker. It's more in the shadow. The front side of it is a little lighter. That's where the sun is coming from. Try to cover up any of these little white spots because you don't want those white spots to grab at the eye. So while that is drying, I'm going to pick a little bit again at this little bit of dark blue that has oozed out of the back of this shell. So with a clean damp brush, I'm just going to drag at that a little. Just try to see blue is very bright, so I keep cleaning my brush. So I'm not just smearing it back and forth. Alright, that's a little better. Alright, let's grab a little of this darker green. And make the spots while we're here. That yellow is still wet. Let's be careful not to get too close to the yellow. Yeah. Fill it out a little bit, but that's okay. Sort of like that effect. It's sort of a natural feel. That's all. Add a little more of it. so bright yellow, which I wanted to avoid. Okay, look. Give us a little more shading on the left side and underneath the mushroom. Alright, his main body is yellow. Now I need to be careful because I just painted the dark blue to get too close to that dark blue, otherwise that will blend in. Right. So nice bright yellow. Again, you generally want your main focal image to have the brightest brights and the darkest darks. So that it draws the eye in towards it. And the other stuff around it should have more neutral kinds of values. So that it doesn't seem quite as much as the main thing that your eye looks at. If everything in the scene is the same range of bright and dark, then it makes it really hard for the eye to know what to focus on and what to look like. And everything sort of competes with each other in a mishmash. Being careful near the blue, especially that blue, which looks wet. Oh, I think I achieved it. Get some bright yellow for the little antennas. make his underside a little darker. That's 
what's in the shadow. That would be the darkest out of all of them. This part over here on his back would also be fairly dark. some reason. Come back to us video. Hopefully it was returning soon. I guess we'll find out. Yep, we're back. So again, you want areas of high contrast to be the main focus. I wouldn't want to make that mushroom in the back have a really high focus because it would just draw your eye back there. And its purpose back there is just to be a little highlight to the scene and not the main thing that you are drawn to look at. all sorts of things to decorate the nail shell. And I don't want to go too crazy because you know you could use whatever decorations you want to. So I think what I'm going to do is first add in a few little flowers and things. The idea is just to give some sort of additional life to what's going on here. The little leaves. And again, I don't want them to draw too much away from the center of snail. It's just adding a little bit of that there's something going on here rather than just green grass. And do we want to put anything in the sky? I mean, we could put a little bird of some sort, I suppose. But again, we don't want too many different things going on that draw away from this snail being of in interest. Alright, so we'll add some little, little flowers. I need them blue flowers, but we're really going to giant blue snail here. Alright, different kinds of things going on. Little speckles on him. So mostly fade into him when it dries, but still, there's a little bit of sense of texture and something unusual. Alright. 
what do we do to the snail shell? I think I'm going to keep it blue. I was tempted to put some yellow things or some green things in there, but I think that that might make it too cluttered. I'll just stick with blue for the snail shell. Yeah, some ridge lines. Mega metal mostly fade in, but still the idea is to give a sense. Few things in nature are just straightforward single color blocks. They have shadows and nooks and crannies and other things. And it's a balance of adding the details so that they can be seen versus making the scene so cluttered that it's hard to make out the main shapes anymore. I think in terms of layers. And maybe we'll put in another maybe a shading in here. Further differentiate between the different layers of the shell. Oh no kitten. This is a snail. I'm just playing with shadows now. Down at the knee. All right, anyway, you get to hear painting on shadows and decorations and everything on this snail ad infinitum. Okay, and yes, certainly I'm going to paste the pictures of all three when I'm done. I try to always do that.
Right, and it, the screen shows a bunch of glimmers on his shell, but that's just the light reflecting off of it. There, there isn't actually any white spots in there, because those would draw the eye too much. So hopefully when I turned it, we'll see when it catches up with me, that it should uh, show that it's just a solid blue. Well, that's funny, it's, it's pretty far behind me. I wonder if it's because it had that other problem before. Alright, well in any case, I think that is pretty set, at least as a first pass. And you can see that, you know, you could still add a bunch more direct uh, de decorations and shading to the grass and all that other kind of stuff. But in general, I suppose we should need a little bit of grounding underneath the uh, mushroom. So we'll do that. Make sure it's a little more green for grass. So it's just a little bit of, not quite that dark. A little bit of grounding under here. Give it a little bit of shadow so the mushroom looks connected to the scene. Alright, so we've got a little bit of shading. I need a little more towards the back. That's where most of the snail shell is. There we go. I want the shadow to look reasonably in proportion with the creature. Alright, so I get a snail with a shadow and a snail shell. A little bit of grassy things. And then, you know, now you can start picking away at it and say, alright, well this stem over here is a little too bright. You don't want that to be like the focal of the attention. So you fix that so it's a little less bright. All that kind of stuff. But you could sit here doing that sort of stuff for hours and hours, and that's not the point of this. It's just to get a general sense of what one could do with three colors and how one goes about the creative process for it. Oh, see, and now when I look at this, there's some white spots in here that catch the eye, so we just want to get those painted away. Because you do not want the eye drawn to little white spots under the snail and the shadow. <laughs> you want that to be shadow. Alright, so cerulean blue, green light, and gamboge. And in this case I wanted blue to be the feature color, so I went with blue for a snail shell and used the other colors as accents. And again the aim here was to make the center point have the darkest darks and the latest lights, so it really draws your eye into that and to have the rest of it be more neutral in value not too dark and not too light, so it sort of fades into the background. And, and that's also what I was trying to do with the frog there. Again, I made this part of the lily a little too bright to do that, so I could fade that lily even a little more to make the yellow a little less bright and the lily pad a little less dark and so on, so that it fades a little more, sort of like how this mushroom does. So it fades a little more into the background because it's got gentler colors involved with it. Alright, so we've got a frog and a snail. And I think that this one is a case where I will add a spattering. Although, you know, I really like spattering things, so maybe I should add a spattering to all of these. I'm going to rinse off my brushes first. up there. Spattering gets everywhere. I'll leave those out. So it's good to have cardboard or something down before you do this. I'll we'll start with the frog since the frog went first. It's good to have the picture part fairly dry before you spatter things on top of it so that the spattering colors stay nice and crisp and don't merge down into the wet paints that are down there before. Alright, so spattering is done well with a stiff brush, so you can flick it and the little colors spray out over everything. And it's a balance that you want the brush wet. If you get it too wet, then you'll make giant 
thin droplets. If it's too dry, then you might have thick gobs. So it's all a bit of trial and error to see what you like. You can practice on, you know, just regular plain paper and see what kind of spatters you enjoy. So you will find out. And actually, I will do this little assembly line while I've got blue on here. I'm going to do blue for all three. Especially for this flowers where I didn't have a blue sky in there, the spattering gets that nice sense of the blue sky going on there. Alright, so I've done all the blue that I'm of mine to do. Rinse that off. Get my brush nice and clean. I'm going to go on to green. Make sure I don't have any giant globs that are going to come out. Ah, see, I kind of did it anyway. Alright, i got some green in there. Well, oh, you're always being careful about blobs. Alright, so I'll just brush that blob into the scene. So we've got green there. Green there. Off the green. Hey Laura, good to see you. Thank you. Just finishing up. A little yellow. picture. Because it looks sort of like a flowery splash. It was not so bad. Alrighty. Always rinse your brushes out when you're done. Store them upright like that they can store without getting squished or bent. Just 
been my thank you. Alright, so again to summarize, this was a random three color challenge. I drew randomly out of a bin the colors Gamboge, Green Light, and Cerulean Blue. So those are the only three colors I had to work with. I put those colors down. I was able to mix them to make some other kinds of greens. But mostly <laughs> all I could make was greens, greens, and more greens out of those colors. So I came up with some sorts of designs that I could create that would work well with greens, yellows, and blues. So the idea is just to let your mind be loose, be creative, be relaxed, have some fun, and learn more about color mixing and how things work together and so on. So let me know if you have any questions. Certainly give this a try yourself. Draw some random colors out of your crayons or colored pencils or whatever you work with and see what you can do with them. And I'd love to see the results that you create. Have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy your creativity. So next up on this Saturday morning, we have Laura O. Senadella doing Facebook Live. So go on to Facebook Live and look for Laura O. Senadella, or I will put a link on the Blackstone Valley Art Association page so that you can find it easily. I will type that in the chat as well. Next up for this afternoon, we have fantastic artist Laura Sinabella taking live from her studio on her Facebook page. I'll post a link. Be sure to watch. She is amazing. Alright, everybody, let me know if you have any questions. I am happy to help. We all support each other. Just let your mind go and have fun. The key to it is to have fun, relax, and the more you paint, the more you'll develop your own style and head in a direction that makes you happy. So have a great afternoon.